Hi everybody. Today I'm going to show you how to auto-generate spring integration tests with artificial intelligence by using DiffBlue's IntelliJ plugin. I'm going to be using the Spring Pet Clinic application, which you can get clone uh, easily by just going into the video's description area below. And we're going to be concentrating on providing integration tests for the VET controller component, which is a Spring MVC at controller. The nice thing with this project is that it already comes with developer tests, right? So in VET controller tests here, we're going to take a look at the human generated tests. And then we're going to use the DiffBlue plugin to write the test for that specific VET controller. And we're going to have a competition. We're going to see who wins, human or artificial intelligence. Who wrote the better tests? And the results are quite surprising. So. I'm looking forward to kind of breaking this down for you and seeing some pros and cons out of each uh, one of those sides. As a closing point, we're going to be injecting a breaking change and seeing how this net or the safety net of uh, auto-generated integration tests are going to be able to catch a regression so that we don't introduce that into our application at runtime. The first videos that I made and the first blog post that I made was actually made out of pure interest and belief in the product. Since then, actually, DiffBlue has reached out to me and they've also passed along to you, if you go in the description below, a link for three free months of their professional edition. We're going to concentrate solely on the VET controller. So go on that and right click and select write tests. So off it goes and it's going to start analyzing not only your source code but the byte code and it's going to come up with those auto generated tests all right so it is done and we can see here it's asking us if we want to uh, add that to get i'm going to say no i'm not going to want to add that right now and you can see here that we have vet controller diff blue tests we have the ai power test and we have the developer generated test or you know the human tests so let's take a look at the differences between both of them but before we do that let's actually take a look at the source code for the vet controller and see what's going on there we can see that it's an mvc controller we've got two methods both mapped with um, get mappings one is mapped with a dot html url why because it's returning actually a string as a return type so the view resolver mechanism is kicking in here which means that this is going to get forwarded to some templating engine in this case it's timeleaf right so we're going to get an html view of the data this one over here is more of a restful kind of URL where we have just slash vets, which means it's going to get all the veterinarians. And you can see here it's got a special kind of annotation on the return type call response body. Now what that does is it's going to automatically set the content type uh, to whatever the client, in this case a browser, is interested in having. So it's going to send maybe the browser an accept header saying, I want this in XML or I want this in JSON, so on and so forth. And there's going to be a content negotiation there. And there's going to be a message converter that's going to actually see if it can support whatever uh, type of data, representation of the data that the client uh, wants. So in this case, in, if you go dig in deep into the pet clinic, you'll actually see that it supports XML. All right. Now, also inside the uh, libraries, the external libraries, there is the Jackson library. So actually, you can request, the browser could request that all the veterinarians be returned as a JSON representation, and that would still work. So what I've done now is on the left hand side over here, I have the developer written tests. And on the right hand side, I have the test written by the diff blue IntelliJ plugin. The developer test on the left hand side, if I make this a little bit bigger here, we can see that it loads a web uh, MVC test specifically for the VET controller. So here we're talking more about loading a subset of the Spring application context, a smaller slice of it in order to test it in isolation. 
Now, of course, we're always going to be using our mock bean and our mock MVC in these kind of instances here, kind of tests. And we can see there's two tests uh, that have been written, one that tests the uh, HTML version of the ad controller and the other one that tests more the RESTful endpoint over here. Now, if we go back to the AI generated tests, we could see right off the bat they've done things a little bit differently. First of all, they're not using uh, the same WebMVC test. They're using a context configuration uh, along with the extend width <clears throat> for spring extension. And, and that's a little bit larger slice in terms of the spring application context that gets loaded. So we're going to get more um, <clears throat> configuration classes, at service classes, that kind of thing. So the slice is a little bit bigger. And as you can see here, we're not really using mock MVC. We are actually going to be using builders to programmatically build up the mock MVC object. So this is more of a, a programmatic, more controlled way of doing things. At the end of the day, you're still going to get your mock MVC just through a builder. Let's go over back to the AI generated test and we're going to see that it attempted to actually uh, create a constructor test. However, it deemed it incomplete. I'm more of the mind of kind of removing this one. I don't really see uh, the need for that, right? The other tests though, we're going to uh, compare this test with the developer test and you're going to see that there is actually a surprising difference, right? So let's do that right now. You can see on the developer tests that if we're talking about testing the HTML uh, view, that it tests that the response is okay, that the model that was placed inside uh, that view is named vets, and that also that the expected template that's being forwarded to, that return type uh, in that ad controller, is actually vets, vet lift. So that's fine. But let's go take a look at how the AI powered one um, has done it okay so it's actually down in the middle here uh, again it's using a builder that's that's not a problem so we get back to the same place uh, we are comparing again that it's okay we're comparing that the attribute exists vets but here is an extra check it actually checks that the size of the model is one so that is not checked in the developer test making sure that you only have what you put in there is important. The other thing that it does, not only does it also check the name that's being returned, the uh, timely template string, but also it makes sure, it goes a step further, and it makes sure that that is actually forwarded down into that view. So we have two extra assertions here for the uh, AI power test, which I think is a much better test. Now let's go back to the second developer test that we have here and, and see what's going on here. Now this is more of a RESTful type of uh, URI here, it's just slash vets. You can see here that the client is sending the type of media that it's interested in, in getting as a response, which is application.json and we see that we're expecting a status of is okay. Now, once this is exercised, the uh, content type that's gonna be sent back is application JSON, and we're also testing that inside that JSON structure that the first um, array element in that list is actually gonna be equal to one, which is what we've set up here in the before each. Like I said, it's the only thing that's really used from that setup. Uh, this is fine. This is going to work, obviously, because like I said, the Jackson libraries are a part of the class path. So the model is simple enough that there are no extra JSON annotations needed in the pet clinic to make this work. So this is actually uh, fine. They should actually have here uh, application XML value instead of application uh, JSON. So let me show you exactly uh, what I'm talking about here. If we go back to the original uh, project, and the vets object will be more apparent. You can see here that we're talking about XML root, an XML element that come from 
uh, the Java X XML binding annotation packages. So we're not talking about JSON. So it's quite surprising that the developer tested for JSON. Now, there's nothing wrong with that because it'll still work like I said, but there is no test that specifically tests for this behavior. So that is something that we need to address because we're not fully testing what we need to be testing. If we go back now to the AI generated test, we're going to see a very different story. We're going to see that um, again up here, it does the same thing as the developer test. However, it's actually checking for application XML and it's actually going even further and looking at not only the contents type, but the string inside the source code of that page and seeing and confirming that it's actually encoded in the proper format, in this case, XML, right? So this test actually is testing the correct behavior that we've coded. In my opinion, the AI power tests in this scenario, right, we're just dealing with one controller specifically, so we're putting everything under a microscope, is actually better. It's worth noting that although the AI power test is more in line with the code base in this case because of the application XML, that we still would like to keep our developer test that is exercising the return type, the data being returned to us in a JSON format, right? So there's nothing wrong with this. We would include both of them in our army of integration tests. So we're now ready to execute our tests. We got our developer tests that we are going to run. So we can see that these developer tests passed as expected. And now let's give a shot to the div blue test and do this run view controller div blue test. All right. So we can see here that three tests passed and now we have confidence moving forward that we are casting a wider and wider net in terms of making sure that we, if we introduce a breaking change, that we're gonna have the safety net there to catch a regression. So this brings me through my third point, which is catching a regression. Let's actually make a breaking change in the VET controller class. Now the VET controller class, it could very well have been split up into two classes, one with um, a REST controller, that wouldn't need to have a response body. Another one that would just be this part over here as a normal controller returning um, basically a, a timely view over here. So there's a little bit of a mixing of, uh, of architectural styles over here. But perhaps somebody comes along and doesn't really recognize that and just kind of goes in here and says REST controller from the uh, Spring Framework. Over here. Now, if they commit that change, Right. Let's say we now have new behavior. We want to go to the diff blue uh, plugin and we want to generate new tests from that. So we're going to go here and we're going to say once more, uh, write tests. Looks like our tests are complete over here. And I'm going to run the test to make sure that uh, that we're good, that what I put into that controller class, which is now a REST controller, doesn't break any of the tests that were written before I made that change, right? Because if that did break one of the tests, we would have a regression. We can actually go in here and uh, go take a look at why this one is failing. And uh, it'll tell us here, well, there's no model in view found. Now, why is that? Why is this actually um, you know, breaking a test now, once you go back to the VET controller class, um, you can see here that this is the method that's actually stopped working. Because we're using REST controller, the developer who changed at controller to REST controller didn't realize that you cannot return uh, a string uh, from a method now, which is inherently um, annotated with at rest body. Now this one is explicitly annotated, but because we put rest controller up here, this method also has a response body. And so it's trying to find a converter in order to map that into some sort of contents type uh, that the browser in this case has requested, but there is none. But also the other thing that happens is, is there is no model and view that gets returned to that mechanism. So that's why there is no model and view and that's why that fails. 
All right, well, let's take a look at the actual application. <clears throat> when you actually deploy the application, and again, you just right click on that project and deploy it. Uh, this is the home page. This is the owners. Of course, if you just say find owner, you'll get a list of owners, but we're testing out the veterinarians here, right? And you could see right now that it's it's stopped working as it should. It's just returning us that string. So something stopped working. We can actually see this at the front end. It used to be like this. This is how it was working before. That's what it used to be. But now vets.html returns this. So we have a breaking change. However, this one, which is just the vets, which is more the RESTful endpoint, returns the XML list. That one still works. If I refresh this, I shouldn't have any problems. It'll still return to me that XMLish version because those tests are written uh, in order to uh, prove that even before we get to this point. So we just caught a regression in the test and I just showed you how that regression would look like to an end user if we had not had those tests there to help us out. So in resume, I think that the developer tests do have a value and they were pretty much in line with the auto-generated AI tests. However, I felt that the AI tests more closely mimicked the application behavior. Uh, again, going back to testing XML instead of JSON and the best thing to do is to obviously combine them both. Uh, this uh, plugin or AI in general cannot identify those highest value tests that still you and I can uh, identify. So obviously this doesn't mean that we stop writing tests. However, we don't have to write every single test anymore. So these two tests mimicked each other quite, um, quite a bit actually. And so because of that, I would say that you gain a tremendous amount of time and save a lot of money on a project level in order to incorporate uh, this type of testing inside your CI CD workflow here. So until next time, guys, um, I'll be getting the next one ready. Don't forget to go to mvpjava.com, sign up for the newsletter to get exclusive uh, information that uh, nobody else can get. It's free. And also please subscribe to my YouTube channel and turn on the notification bell to know when new videos are coming out. Thanks once again, guys. Have a good one.